Question. When did pink become a girl color? For centuries, all kids wore dresses and grew their hair long until the age of six or seven. This wasn't just because little kids look adorable in dresses, it was for practical reasons. Toilet training was much easier in a dress and diapers, since the fasteners that held up pants in those days weren't easy for kids to use. On top of that, it took kids much longer to grow out of a dress than a pair of pants which meant parents didn't need to spend as much money on clothes for their kids. Around the mid-1800s, children's clothes started hitting the shelves in pastel colors like pink and blue, but they weren't intended to be gender-specific. By 1918, that had changed. The general rule at the time was pink for boys and blue for girls. The reason, according to an article from that year, was, quote, Pink being a more decided and stronger color is more suitable for the boy while blue, which is more delicate and dainty, is prettier for the girl. That's right. Less than a hundred years ago, our idea of pink and blue was the complete opposite. So, when did the color switch happen? It started in the late 1940s, when the concept of the ideal American family took shape. Men were expected to join the workforce, while women were expected to stay at home with the children. Retailers and marketers started packaging more feminine products in pink, and mothers started buying them up. From that point forward, pink was more and more associated with femininity, but it wasn't until the 1980s that the line between boy and girl colors became clear. For the first time, parents could find out the gender of their baby before it was born. Expecting parents wanted to shop for their new baby, and businesses realized that pink and blue could make them some serious green. Around the same time, laws were passed which let companies advertise their products to kids without nearly as many rules as there used to be. So, kids today are exposed to lots of advertising all around them that tends to reinforce what it means to be a boy or a girl, including what colors you should wear. In other words, there's no such thing as boy or girl colors, so just wear whatever you like. And now you know why pink is considered a girl color. Comment below if you have a burning question you'd like to know the answer to. We may just answer it. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe for more episodes of Castle Questions! Only on DreamWorks TV. What happens after you die? Now, we won't be talking about what happens to your soul. That's way too colossal a question to answer in a two minute YouTube video, but we can say what happens to the body. In the first few seconds after death, brain activity spikes and then stops completely. Body temperature, which usually hovers around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, will start dropping by 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit every hour until it reaches room temperature. Within just a few minutes, cells start to break down because they're no longer receiving oxygen from the lungs. After just a few hours, the calcium in the body starts to collect in the muscles, making them stiff. After about a day and a half, the muscles will relax again. In just a few weeks, hair starts falling out, and all sorts of little bugs eat over half of the body. After several months, depending on the temperature, everything will completely decompose until just a skeleton is left. Kinda spooky. Okay, wait, so if a body becomes a skeleton after just a few months, how do archaeologists find mummies and preserved people from thousands of years ago? That's a good question, me. Well, for starters, most of the time, bones are what archaeologists dig up. Bodies that stay preserved that long are way more rare and go by a name you've probably heard, mummies. A mummy is a dead person or animal whose body is preserved intentionally or unintentionally long after their death. Most people can picture a mummy that was made on purpose, but sometimes it can happen accidentally. For example, there are chemicals in peat bogs that can almost perfectly preserve bodies for hundreds or even thousands of years. Extremely dry places like deserts can also keep a body mummified naturally, as can extreme cold. Probably the most famous example of a spontaneous mummy is Otzi. Also known as the Iceman, Otzi is an extremely well-preserved natural mummy of a man who lived and died more than 5,000 years ago. His body was found on an icy mountain range in 1991, completely encased in ice. He's the oldest known natural mummy in Europe, and since being found, has helped scientists discover tons of new information about what it was like to live thousands of years ago. Now that's just about as cool as ice! Or maybe I just have the chills from all this death talk. 
Are boys stronger than girls? It might seem like men are generally stronger than women, but the truth isn't so simple. Both boys and girls have advantages and disadvantages that end up evening out to relatively equal strength. Here's how. It is true that men are generally taller, heavier, and have bigger muscles than women. Studies have shown that, on average, men have over 20 pounds of extra muscle and 30 to 40 percent more upper body strength. That's because men naturally produce more of the hormone testosterone than women, which is what helps your muscles grow big. But girls are much better at fighting off diseases. Women's bodies make more of the antibodies and blood cells you need to fight off illness much faster than men. That means, on average, girls get less infectious diseases and recover faster when they do get sick. Now, back to the boys. Men generally have bigger hearts, lungs, and veins known as the cardiovascular system. That means boys' bodies can keep more energy stored for later. All that blood flow also helps boys to heal faster from wounds. But to make up for that, women are likely to have lower blood pressure than men, which means they're less likely to get cardiovascular disease in the first place. Boys have a smaller chance of becoming depressed or developing an anxiety disorder, but girls are less likely to develop psychiatric disorders. So, are boys stronger than girls? Well, if you're just looking at muscle mass, then yes, boys are typically stronger. But the science shows us that boys and girls are both strong, just in slightly different ways. Why do diamonds cost so much? A couple hundred years ago, diamonds were so rare that almost all of them were owned only by kings and queens. Average people in those days never dreamed of owning a diamond. But all that changed in 1870, when miners in South Africa discovered giant deposits of the precious stones. The market for diamonds quickly flooded, making them both common and fairly cheap. This wasn't lost on businessman, mining magnate, and all-around jerk to the native Africans, Cecil Rhodes. He spent the next 18 years buying up shares of the diamond mines, until he controlled the entire South African supply of diamonds in 1888. All was going well for Rhodes and his newfound diamond monopoly, until the Great Depression hit in the 1930s. Since so many people during the Depression were extremely poor, luxury goods like diamonds stopped selling. In fact, by the late 30s, many brides in the U.S. didn't even have an engagement ring. Now, Rhodes and his company had a huge supply of diamonds and very little demand, so they took matters into their own hands. Since buying diamonds was considered such an unnecessary luxury, the company decided the way to get people to buy them was to appeal to their emotions. So, appeal they did, launching what's probably the most successful advertising campaign in American history. They branded diamonds as the default signal for wealth, commitment, rarity, brilliance, and all important emotional moments in life. Milestones like marriage, anniversaries, and birthdays all become opportunities to buy and receive diamonds. So, by controlling how many diamonds are available to buy, and by tying them to life's biggest milestones, diamonds are now available everywhere and sell for way more than they're actually worth. It's not so different from when your favorite toy company puts out 15 limited edition action figures for thousands of dollars each. They could sell them for less if they released way more of them. Sorry, I just really wanted a limited edition alternate attire optimal alpha action figure. And now you know why diamonds cost so much. Comment below if you have a burning question you'd like to know the answer to. We may just answer it. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe for more episodes of... Colossal Questions! Only on DreamWorks TV. Do animals dream? The hardest part about answering this question for scientists is that, well, pets can't tell us about their dreams. But basically everything we do know about whether or not animals dream comes from what we know about our own dreams. Each night, about an hour or two after you fall asleep, your eyeballs will start darting around behind your closed eyelids. This stage of your sleep cycle is called REM, or REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement. During this stage, your body is powered down, but your brain is as active as when you're awake. For humans, the REM stage is when dreaming begins. Many scientists have looked at the brain activity of sleeping animals to try and solve the mystery once and for all. 
What they found is that almost all mammals and birds have a REM stage when they sleep, and cold-blooded animals like reptiles, amphibians, and fish don't. But the research didn't stop there. Researchers at MIT put rats on a track and measured their brain activity while they moved towards food at the other end of the track. Once the same rats fell into the REM stage of sleep, they measured their brain again and saw identical patterns. This led scientists to believe that the rats were dreaming about running for food on the track. Many experts believe the same thing is true for dogs. Like rats, pups likely dream about their day-to-day -day lives and experiences. Pretty cool. Even cooler, the smaller the dog, the more it dreams. Small dogs can have dreams as often as every 10 minutes, while big dogs can have an hour or two between dreams. In another study, scientists measured the brain activity of singing birds. Once the birds fell asleep, the researchers measured again and, you guessed it, the brain activity was almost exactly the same. The experts still don't know for sure, but this has led many to believe that the birds are either dreaming about singing or they can hear their own song in their sleep. So, does your little pug muffin dream? Many experts think it's likely. So next time your dog starts running in place while it's sleeping, rest assured, she's probably dreaming about that great fuzzy tennis ball in the sky. That's a good boy, Mr. Sprinkles. And now you know that most animals probably do have dreams. Comment below if you have a burning question you'd like to know the answer to. We may just answer it. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe for more episodes of... Colossal Questions! Only on DreamWorks TV. Why are bugs so scary? Lots of us seem to have super strong reactions anytime we see a creepy crawler scuttling or squirming around. Cockroaches, centipedes, spiders, and just about every other insect in between makes us squirm. Sure, some of those little critters can sting, poison, or hurt us in some other way, but the vast majority of bugs we see are totally harmless and one well-placed stomp away from annihilation. Experts can't say for sure exactly why we tend to get so panicky, but they do have a few solid theories. The first is that our ancient ancestors had a better chance to survive the more cautious they were. A particularly brave and maybe not so bright caveman might stick his hand straight into a beehive, for instance, while his cautious counterpart lives to find a safer way. Over thousands and thousands and thousands of years, we've developed an instinct from our more careful ancestors to steer clear of bees, bugs, and other creepy little insects. Sure, bugs are mostly pretty small and squishable, but they have all kinds of other qualities that makes them scarier and even more disgusting to us. For example, their small size makes it easy for them to come inside or even crawl up our leg before we notice them. It's one thing to see something in the wild, but once it enters your personal space, it pushes all kinds of uncomfortable buttons in our brains. Their small size also makes it easier for them to skitter around, avoiding any attempts to swat them. But that doesn't mean we're freaked out by all bugs. Butterflies, ladybugs, grasshoppers, fireflies, and caterpillars are just a few examples of creatures most of us aren't too afraid of. Other critters, like ants or worms for example, might freak us out if we see them inside, but out in the dirt, they can be interesting to watch and enjoy. So really, that's a long way of saying that our ancient cave ancestors seem to have taught us a lesson that's been passed down for ages. Better safe than stung. Why are you afraid of the dark? Lots of common fears come from a bad experience, like being afraid of dogs after getting a bad bite. But others, like the fear of the dark, are more universal, more basic, and more ancient. To this day, experts are still trying to determine why nyctophobia is so common all across the globe. Many believe it has less to do with the darkness and more to do with nighttime and the unknown. You see, it's not so much the darkness itself that's spooky, it's all the unknown and unexpected dangers that could be lurking, hidden in the dark. It's hard for a human to spot a threat in the dark, especially when many predators in the wild can see well at night. For most of human history, 
people had to take extra precautions at night to make sure they weren't attacked by an unseen creature prowling nearby. One of the biggest precautions we learned was a natural fear of the dangerous, unpredictable dark. That healthy fear kept us safe during nighttime hours in the wild. Being afraid means you're extra aware and extra vigilant, so being afraid of the dark became an advantage for those sensible enough to be scared. Of course, nowadays, there's not nearly as many reasons for us to fear the darkness. Most of us fall asleep every night safely tucked into a bed inside a house where night prowling predators can't reach. Yet the fear seems to be permanently imprinted into our subconscious and seems to be especially strong in kids. That's because kids have extra active imaginations, which allow them to imagine all sorts of strange dangers that could go bump in the night. So, why are you afraid of the dark? Because your ancestors figured out a long time ago that danger looms in the darkness. And even though most of us don't spend our nights in the wild anymore, it would appear that that fear is here to stay. Thank you.